So, if, first of all, if we could have all the panelists um, just quickly introduce themselves and tell us the, the quick sort of two sentence about what their firm is and, and is for, and then we'll get into the meat of the uh, discussion. So, JP, first. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Patterson. Um, most people know me as JP. Um, I am the managing director of the Innovation and Ventures Unit at DWF. Um, so DWF is a, a listed on the stock market legal business. So we've got a law firm and a number of other businesses. Um, and my role focuses on pretty much trying to find people's ideas and work out whether they're any good um, is one part of it. Um, and more recently, on an interim basis, I also look after legal technology. Great. Thanks, Shara. Uh, morning, everybody. My name's Shara. I'm a senior associate with Pinsent Masons in Manchester. And we are a multinational uh, law firm, but also law business. So we're very focused on trying to offer more than just great legal advice. It's also business acumen and technological innovation, that kind of stuff. And my focus is corporate immigration. So I lead corporate immigration for the UK. All right, thank you. Catherine. Hi, I am Catherine Fernhead, or Cathy, uh, which is my preference. Um, so I am um, a partner at Adelshaw Goddard, uh, based here in Manchester. Uh, and I specialise in real estate, but talk about different hats. Um, I also <laughs> co-head up our energy sector across the firm as well. Um, and Adel Shores is an international law firm. We've been growing our international presence um, more recently. So um, in the UK, we've got six offices, and then we have GCC offices, and then we've now got six European as we're growing that. So that's our bit. Great, thanks, Tom. I all know about Deborah, but should we have a quick word about Shoesmiths? Uh, so Shoesmiths, we're a UK firm, got 13 offices, um, and we're, we're very focused and known for our focus on our people and our culture and our values. Great, okay, well, thanks, everybody. Um, so, first off, I think we, we um, uh, if we start with um, Cathy, um, law firms are businesses. Um, what is the, what are the, what's the fundamental thing that everybody needs to understand about a law firm business? Well, I think law firms are primarily about the people. So how good you are depends on the people and the culture that you bring and, and everything to that and invest in people. People is also the biggest cost of a business as well. So businesses have, um, law firms have sort of three broad headings of expenditure. So you have your people and the salary costs and that's your number one. And, you know, we invest in our people. Um, you then have your overheads. So, you know, we've got Adelshaw's about 2,400 people in the business, um, but over 500 of those are non-lawyers. So that's HR and graduate and IT and GC at risk and, and all of these other um, skill sets that's necessary for a law firm. Um, and then you've got all your electricity and other costs and overheads. And then you've also got your premises costs. So those three things are your big costs um, as a business. And then... Um, where does the money come from? So the money comes from some of our fees that we, we bill. Um, and then, so historically, you well, as a law firm, you have to record every six minutes pretty much as a fee earner. And that's a really weird thing to do, I'll be honest with you. So you it's helped by a little time that you can have on your desktop, but every six minutes. Um, so you record it on a six minute basis because you charge for your time, because what people are buying is your experience and your time. Um, and so you, you, you charge um, on a six, well, you record on a six minute basis, but actually law um, clients need to have some certainty around costs because everybody's cost conscious and particularly with the energy crisis going on at the moment, you know, cost is really important. So in my area in particular, in real estate, we have um, fixed fees. So um, that, that's, that's the element that clients pay for fixed fees. Um, and then we also have technology projects or products as well. So that's a slightly different model as well in how that one's charged. Um, and so really, if your costs go up as a, as a law firm, you get, and, and those six fees, you can't really recover all your six minutes. So you've got to make sure your six minutes you can get within your fixed fee. Um, and so what you look then is how you can, how you can make that work. So if salaries go up, as, as they have done recently, and, and um, quite significantly, then actually um, you've then got to look at how much you, where you can get that money from. And that might be from increasing fees with clients, which, you know, with inflation is appropriate, so, uh, but also doing things more efficiently. Client expects things efficiently. And we can do that through uh, technology. And, it, and so my world over the last 17 years has changed huge, like indescribably hugely. When I qualified, I was doing faxes. So and none of you will know what a fax is. So, um, but you know, so technology and the platforms and the, that we use, um, and also just seeing how we can do things differently. And I think that's really, really important to keep that sort of eye on innovation, not just the really big stuff, but just 
day to day, how can we do things differently? Um, and I think that's really important that everyone feels empowered in our business to come with new ideas and to see how can we do things differently. And it's that constant evolving that means that you can match those two things up. And if you get that wrong and your cost goes too high and you're not getting the fees in, you're in real difficulty as a law firm. So you've really got to look at how you, you balance those two things out. Great, thank you very much. And of course, yeah, I mean, the law firms aren't indestructible. We're in a city where a couple of very big law firms disappeared a few years ago. So um, that, that, you know, that economics is a really good thing to look at and make sure you sort of understand the firm. Um, obviously, firms are continually developing, changing. Um, what, what are some of the drivers or the processes that happen there, JP? I mean, you know, obviously, your, your business model is a, is a, a newer one. Yeah, um, yeah, how yeah. How have things gone, the market um, and the individuals? Yeah, so, so with us, um, we, we have... Uh, gone off piste a little bit in terms of the business model, let's say. So the majority of businesses that would operate in our sector would be partnerships. So they're private partnerships and effectively the decisions and the, the wealth that's generated gets shared across a partnership. Um, a few years ago, we uh, decided for our strategy that that model was a bit restrictive and, and it was restrictive for two reasons. Um, we needed more cash to invest than our partners were willing to put their hand in their pocket for. So we needed some other people to, to step up. Um, and we also felt with the way that the business was going, we needed to move away from just having a thin layer of people um, feeling like they had the ownership of the firm. So for, two, for those two reasons, we, we changed the business model and we, we listed on the stock market. So we've got outside investors. Also, um, over two thirds of our firm own shares in the business. So we're all business owners um, and we raised some capital that allowed us to invest in um, buying other businesses so a bit like Pinsent's we sort of see this idea that it's yes law is the core focus but there's opportunities um, around the legal market to do more than that so we've now got 14 and growing um, other businesses that provide um, services from uh, technology through to claims management through to global entity management, which I didn't even know was a thing when we bought that business. Um, and also, um, it allows us to expand outside of our core market. So again, a bit like some of the other firms, we wanted to move into new jurisdictions. So the, the drivers are always kind of driven really by what you're trying to do for whom. So I think the client's part's really important. Um, and once you've decided that, it's finding the business model that allows you to do that in the best possible way. Great. Okay. Thank you. And we'll, we'll, I think we're going to go back to sort of how big firms should be and why they want to grow in a minute. Um, but first of all, I think one of the things that you know, one of the things all you guys here need to be doing is identifying what kind of firm you want to to, to join. And so, Shara, can you give us a quick rundown of what you know what the the classic classifications of types of firms are? Well. I probably have a, a slightly different background, I think, than um, some of the other people on the panel, certainly because I didn't qualify into a commercial law firm. I qualified into a boutique law firm. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a corporate immigration specialist and my firm where I qualified was only doing that work. So it was very, very small. And obviously, it's a big shift moving from there to, to this type of law firm. But I think it's quite easy to almost get a bit drawn into this idea that there's a huge gulf between working for a, a very big commercial firm and working for a very small corporate for a um, boutique firm, sorry. But there are a lot of parallels that you'll find, I think, between different types of law firm. And it's been said by people on the panel already, and I'd certainly echo it. Everything really is about people. It's about finding the team at which you feel in, at home. Um, and it's about the, the, the purpose of the firm and where it's trying to move to and how it's trying to assist those, those clients. So I think... While you can classify law firms in all of those different ways, you know, kind of saying you've got your huge kind of global corporates, you've got your, your UK focused firms, you've got your tiny little boutiques, really at a very early stage of your career, it, it's not really that important because if you can find the position that really makes you passionate, you know, everything that, that Deborah was saying in terms of her keynote speech about feeling really passionate about what you do and finding those things that really interest you, then you'll you'll find your home and it might not be that you stay in that kind of firm. It might be that you move into something else. And I certainly at the start of my career was not expecting to move into a, a big commercial law firm. But there's so much about being where I am at the moment in terms of the messages that we have, the, the kind of the purpose of the firm, about being creative, about the people, about being bold in terms of what we're doing, working with our clients. That's really inspiring to see. But it's not that I never experienced that in a boutique firm either. It's just on a different scale. 
Great. Okay, thank you. So can the, I can I start? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, of that? course. So I think I think the other thing that, that's really exciting for, for you as you enter the market is there's now more choice than there's ever been before. So when I started out my career, I remember like Deborah, I'm older, so I'm 44, so it's um, it, it was in the time of the facts and whatever else. But it, it, you worked for a law firm. You know, it was either a small law firm or a large law firm. If you look at the market now, it's really interesting. In-house legal departments are, have grown massively in the time I've been in the market, and they run their own training programs, and they, they build their own capabilities. Yes, you've got all the law firms that we've talked about, um, but you've also got alternative legal service providers, uh, lots of jargon in law, so ALSPs is what everyone calls them, but they are new business models, but there's still legal careers there. So there's, there's some very big and fast-growing alternative legal service providers as well. We, we bought one in our group when we listed, a um, very different business model, but actually still requires people with that legal capability, problem-solving skills. So I think one of the really exciting things is there's more choice than ever before, I think. Great, thank you. So, Deborah, we, when one thing we are also seeing is seeing law, law firms getting, the, sorry, the big ones are getting bigger. Why are they doing it? Do they want to? Do they have to? And what's, how, how does that actually happen? I think it, it comes down to your client base. And, and, and if your clients are saying to you, well, actually, you know, we need to do this internationally, and therefore you start saying, right, okay, you know, we, we, we work with um, partner firms over in when we do international work. And that works very well. So we don't need to go on a big acquisition phase and start picking up uh, law firms across the globe uh, until it doesn't work. And then we will potentially look at it. It's not that we, we would never do it, but at the moment it works for our client base. And, and ultimately that's where you go to. You will grow. If you think you've got a particular hole, um, then you will either go and either move by stealth and recruit partners and bits of the team until you've filled that hole. Or you go and you look and say, oh, there's a niche firm that does this. You know, the really important bit when you're doing an acquisition or moving people by stealth is making sure that it all fits together. And, um, you know, if you bring in the wrong culture into your firm, it does more, so much more harm than good. It takes forever to sort it out. If you can sort it out, it shows we are really passionate about the culture and the values. And I'm not going to name any names, but I have worked at places where the culture and the values are not great. They're all over the website. But actually, you get in there and you think, oh, you've just pieced things together here. And um, actually, you haven't taken the time to make the culture bed in. So that's the thing you have to look at. With the big firms that have grown by acquiring and merging, what have they done with the culture? Have they really understood the culture of what they're buying? You'd hope that they have. Um, but sometimes firms make mistakes and they take a while to rectify and then 10 years down the line you see they finally sorted themselves out so the culture is the really important bit but ultimately the driver is the clients you know okay. you need to be able to fill your client needs okay that's yeah so I think we're going to maybe try and look at look at each of each of your firm cultures just to give us a flavor of how they may be different but one um <coughs> One follow-up question there, I guess, Deborah, is, is if I'm one of these people in the audience coming from the outside looking at a firm, what are, the, what are some of the questions I should ask myself to, to try and get under the skin of working out how it's building, how it's grown, what's, you know... I mean, you can go on the websites and you'll see the history of the firm, the, the websites will all talk about the values, but the best way is talking to people who have been there. So coming to days like this and talking to our, you know, our trainees, our newly qualified, and just getting it, you know, Talking to people is how you find out information. Go on the, um, you know, Laws Careers Net, Roll on Friday are all helpful, but they've always got a bit of a slant. So um, Roll on Friday have got their law firm questionnaire thing at the moment. Odds on the people who fill them in are generally the people who are a bit peed off. So it's not a fair reflection of the firm or it's the other end and it's the HR team. So all the glowing comments, you've got to think about that when you're looking at things like that on the internet. The best thing you can do is go and find graduates, um, trainees, NQs who are actually at the firm and talk to them about their experience. And that's by coming to events like this. Okay, so Cathy, if, if someone, yeah, well, someone probably will, come up to you during, the, during one of the networking sessions and say, well, tell me about the culture of your firm. What do you say? Um, 
I've always had a bit of a lift test. Oh, it's harder in mixed use buildings, but um, how friendly the person is in the lift when you go up. Um, and uh, because it is about, so the, the culture for other, culture's a really hard one to describe. It's easier, as Deborah says, to meet people and see what people are like and to have that conversation. Um, but it is, I mean, um, I think it's friendly, and I know everyone is using the word collaborative, but I genuinely, genuinely completely agree with that collaborative bit. It's not about egos, it's about um, respecting everybody, and everyone's got a, review, a, a view and coming together to do the best for clients and being that client focused. So it's really all about delivering for the clients. There's a lot of stuff I, I completely agree with you. It's that make your client look good. So, you know, come up with commercial solutions and, and things. But, you know, it's that whole working together, respecting everybody's individuality and, and, and embracing that and building on that for clients. Um, and I still believe in the test in the, in the lift on um, how friendly somebody is in the lift. But it does make a complete difference. Um, and that culture piece, I cannot emphasize how important it is. And, and I agree completely with Deborah about talking to people. You know, when I, when I said we've grown a lot in Europe, we haven't done it for acquisition probably um, but we've bought teams and it's been based on culture completely and then you can see that because then when we um, ring up so just the um, most recent team is um, in Dublin and they're brilliant but it's that that integration piece only works when you've got that right culture and if it's not the right culture then we won't then we won't expect we we expand where clients want to be um, but we have to get the right culture fit and that's why it's taken us a bit longer than some of the other firms to build that international presence and we've been quite specific about where it is but if there isn't the right team and the right culture, then we won't do it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the... Uh, not quite sure I can explain culture that well, but that's... No, yeah, I, th I, think, I think there's the point. It's, it's, a, it's a slightly intangible. I mean, okay, so, so Shara, you, you, you were mentioning you know, from big to small. Yeah. How, how, how would you say there were... Cult what, what were the culture differences there or you know, identifiable things, perhaps by necessity because of size? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a certain extent to which it almost doesn't really matter what kind of size firm you're in because you'll always be within a team. And if you don't have good connectivity between the, the team, which regardless of whether you're in a big or a small firm, that team will probably only ever be around the size of maybe 15 people or so that you're going to work with on a day-to-day -day basis really closely, I would say. Um, and obviously, if you're not connected, then you're not connected, whether you're, you know, you're sat in one office or if you're spread across the world. Uh, one thing that I've really found... Because I, I haven't been with Pinsons for that long. I actually joined them earlier this year in January. And the one thing that I've really found is, given what I do, international um, you know, immigration, so it's kind of global mobility, that kind of thing. So I do have a lot of contact with people in different offices. And there's that real kind of commitment to trying to make sure that it is one team between those offices. But, you know, exactly, exactly as you were just saying, you know, that idea that if there's no commitment within the firm, to that it, it's just kind of lip service and it, it simply doesn't work because they will just be people that you occasionally speak to when you might need to maybe once every few weeks or so so there really does have to be a proper commitment from a firm from you know right from the top all the way down to the bottom to to actually commit and make that one team and obviously it is challenging because you're dealing with people in different time zones you're dealing with people from different cultures if you're in an international firm as well but if everybody's pulling towards the same thing and the Pins and Masons has got kind of a specific <coughs> purpose, which is to make business work better for people, and everybody's working towards that one common goal. Then you're all starting from the same point, at least. So there's there's some cohesion there immediately. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on from culture, let's think. Obviously, again, we, we as Cathy identified that one of the key things is that the um, the law firm's got to do business to um, and sell its sell its expertise. So what is JP? What are some of the things that a firm does to, or a firm, or a team, or a department does to to win new business, to find new business. How does the role thing keep rolling along? Um, so I, I I think each each law firm will probably have their own uh, strategy for how they do it because it will depend on what services they've got, which clients they're servicing, how big they are, what markets they're in. But I think if you think about it just generally, um, if I think about our advisory business, which is where we've got most of our lawyers that provide legal advice, um, the majority of that work is won through human relationships. So it's, it's human to human building up trust and uh, understanding and nine out of 10 pieces of work that we'll win will be won through that kind of relationship. They call it relationship marketing, but effectively it's human to human getting on well, understanding what they're trying to do and and supporting them to deliver an app. And, and it can be summed up really easy by helping that individual look good, which I think is a, a really good way of describing it. If you move into smaller other businesses, 
um, that are not advice. So we've got the MindCrest, which is an alternative legal service provider. So that actually wants to provide big multi-year outsourced pieces of work uh, done in a completely different way to traditional advice. So actually, there's still some relationship involved, but for that, there's a lot more brand-based marketing. So people understand who we are, what we do. Um, there's a lot more procurement, the dreaded P word. If you ever come across procurement in clients, they always make life more complicated. They start asking very difficult questions about price and how, how much can you cut off and whatever else. So there's a procurement process there, which, which is much more institutional. So you've, you've almost got two ends of the spectrum. One's very personal, and it's about personal brand and a following and trust. And then actually on the other side of our business, it's actually quite enterprise level. It's a company. Sometimes it feels like a faceless company um, purchasing services, and it becomes a lot more about more traditional marketing uh, techniques around you know, becoming known, being in the right, in the right process. Um, and, and I think everything else fits somewhere in between those two extremes. Um, so I think one of the things I would say is work out which bit of that continuum you're in and don't get them mixed up. Because if you try relationship marketing to a procurement person, believe me, that doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, and actually, if you try the kind of mass brand-based marketing to somebody who's trying to purchase higher value advice, um, so that doesn't work either, really. There's almost like a tradition that that's a bit... So like, oh, I don't like being sold to, so please don't do that. Um, so I think I think they're the two broad bears, and, and yeah, don't get them mixed up. Great, thank you. Any, anyone got anything to add on? I think, and the other, which is absolute basics, just do a good job. <laughs> it sounds, and, and, and I, I don't even know how to say it without, don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm on the other side of a lawyer, I want them to say, actually, we can have a sensible conversation, and we want to work with you again. So I... Adel Shaw's banking team, I get on really well with the, the, the main partner, with Martin O'Shea, and we, our teams work well together. So quite often someone will say, oh, who do you think is going to be on the other side? And they'll say three names, and I say, let's have Martin. And it's about working together. And then when you do the deal, the amount of clients I've got who say, we want you again. And, and in my world, the banks, they go out for three quotes and you need to be the cheapest. You don't actually need to be the cheapest, but they need to know they're getting good value for money, but the job is done and everybody gets to the end not hating each other. So just do your job. And that, you can't go far wrong. If you said you're going to do something, just do it. I mean, my other, my other thing is actually, you know, do more than is expected of you. But in fairness, if you just do what you say you're going to do, you will actually really stand out. Because I can't tell you how many people say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to send you that a week later. Not meaning to chase, but where is it? <laughs> so just do what you've said you're going to do and you will immediately be streets ahead. And that's how, there's nothing better than getting business from the clients that you already work for. That's the dead easy bit. Getting new clients, that's hard work. <laughs> it is hard work. So any, any, any new, new clients? Yeah totally new client techniques and the things that people do? Uh, a lot of my work is actually from clients and, and repeat clients and in that sense because it is about doing a good job and it is about um, being someone that they less like working with so that they can pick up the phone and, and I have a bit of a chat and it's nice and you know what, what they're doing on the weekend and you can have a, and you build that relationship and just life is more enjoyable doing, doing deals like that, I find. Um, and then winning new business, is a, there's a lot of panel appointments out there, and that has increased quite a lot. And panel appointments, I mean, we've got a bids team and a business team. I mean, a, panel appointments are, are just a um, awesome. bit of a beast, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of prep and a lot of documents and all the rest of it. And then, and then you don't get it when it's after all and that. Then, yeah. <laughs> but then you have to work at panels to, like, once you're on one, you've got to work mm. at it to, to build those relationships because it's back to relationships again. Because if you're new on a panel, and, and we were, um, National Grid was one, I'd just be my partner on the National Grid panel. We, we, we got onto the panel. But those, all the other incumbent panel law firms that are there, they've already got relationships and the work still comes from individuals, even if you're on a panel. So then you've really got to work at building up those relationships and being someone they can trust. And I think, and that, the panel piece especially. So the panel bit is what, like the bid team do most of the work. And then you have to go to the pitch, which is scarier than anything, especially when you've not done one before. I got dragged into one at 24 hours notice because the partner had forgotten it was his kid's birthday. Deborah, can you go? <laughs> mm, don't think I can say no. 
But they, so that's at that level. But then when you get on the panel, you all need to know. So I, I say to my juniors all the time, I don't need you to know the CEO or the FD. I need you to know the grads. I need you to know the people at your level so that people can look and go, oh, well, I know X, Y, and Z at Hugh Smith. And that's brilliant. It's, it's down to all of you on the relationship building, not just the partners. And you will progress so much further and so much faster the better your network is. And that starts right now. Great, thank you. Um, so I was sort of going to ask what was a good makes a good commercial world, but I think you've said quite a lot about this. So if anyone's got anything to add on that, maybe we can do that towards the end. Um, before we progress, does anybody on the floor have any questions? Uh, like, what? Okay. Oh, there's some scrolls. <laughs> Problem is, we're all facing away from the screen. So. Oh gosh. Um, so, okay, what are the current opportunities and risks that you see right now in the current climate that will specifically affect your firm? Shara, how about you have a go at that? <laughs> <laughs> Why, thanks. <laughs> well, okay. I guess international immigration is quite a lot of stuff yeah, to Yeah, I, I mean, I might just focus on immigration for a minute, if that's okay, because obviously it, it's... It's an interesting area to work in right now because it's very politically sensitive for a start, but also there's a there's that big balance at the moment, in the, particularly in the UK, between the political approach towards immigration and then the economic reality towards immigration. And those two things are not necessarily the same. And it's quite challenging to try and be able to navigate for clients between what's actually available and what they need to achieve. And I think actually, to be fair, this probably does come to the point as well of what does make a good commercial lawyer. And particularly in corporate immigration, I think what makes you a good lawyer is being able to talk to a client and I work out what it is that they need to achieve and actually find a business answer for that. Because it's very, very easy to just be able to kind of point out you've got this, this and this option. But I mean, the point was made in your speech earlier as well. You know, they need an opinion from you to be able to actually say, this is what's going to be the best route for you. And I think what's challenging at the moment in the current climate is that sometimes there is no answer to that. Particularly in immigration, they might want to do something and the answer is, well, that route, that route doesn't exist at the moment, I'm afraid, or that's going to be very challenging for you for this particular reason, or that's going to cost you a lot of money for this particular reason. But ultimately, and particularly in the current climate, I think Clients just need you to be able to give them real advice that doesn't just exist in a vacuum. You know, particularly with immigration, it's going to have an impact on employment law. It's going to have an impact on tax liability. There are all different ways where these things are going to overlap. And being alive to knowing what's being engaged here and what actually is the best commercial answer for that client, I think, is the most challenging thing. And also the connecting, I mean, I'm miles away from, from you on the banking side, but they want to know the value that you present is you see the market and you don't have to break any confidences, but they want to know that other people yeah. are stressing <coughs> about the same things. And, you know, someone's tried this and actually it didn't work, especially at the moment. You know, during COVID with C-bills, when the, the government announced, all oh, right, we've given all this money to the banks and the banks were literally like, well, we don't know how to get it out. We don't know. Like, we were literally, that was really quite stressful. And nobody wants to pay for it either, which was even more stressful. But it, it was that, well, actually, these guys are doing this and that didn't work so well. So maybe we'll go down and thinking on your feet very, very quickly and, and just sharing the knowledge that you've got from seeing the full market. They really appreciate that. That's what they're paying you for, the value. So, for instance, how, how, you know, I guess one of the things in your world is going to be cost of borrowing is rocketing. What does that well, mean? Well, it's coming back down again you now. Let's okay. just, you know. Okay, oh. well, it was rocketing. So, what, what, yeah, so how has that affected you know, the advice you were giving a month ago and the advice you're giving today? Do the deals, do the deals. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, six, six weeks ago, deals were just, right, put them on hold because we've, we've been in a low interest rate environment. We've got, we, I've got lawyers who've never seen interest rates do what they've done over the last six weeks. Um, I fortunately sort of grew up during the financial crisis, so I'm, I have seen how it hap what happens when the money suddenly dries up. This is very different to the financial crisis. That was a liquidity issue. This is, this is caused by nine million different issues all at once happening in a five-week period. But ultimately, it's, it's the instability that causes everybody to panic. And, and, and those five weeks, people literally just went, we just need to sit and wait. And, and, and it was kind of, we don't have an answer. Actually, the fundamentals of the business, so in real estate finance, the fundamentals, the rent, the tenants, were all still working. But the interest rate, you had no idea what was going to happen. Who knew what was going to happen in two more weeks? So 
but sharing that everybody else felt the same way and they weren't sitting on an outlier position to everybody else made every, gives people the comfort and then you just react accordingly. Um, but it is just reassurance here is getting a bit better. <laughs> I mean, Cathy, I guess, I guess one, one, one truism is that whether the market's going up or the market's going down, things are good or things are bad, the lawyers are always okay. Is that, is that a reasonable characterisation? Um, in many sense, as, a, as a, a firm as a whole, you will have quieter periods and you'll have busier periods. So um, it tends to be that um, if real estate, my area, is going down a bit, our BSR team is often in, in other cycles, going, so our insolvency team is going up because uh, it just we fluctuate. We've got real estate lawyers in both, so we second each other to, and to the, our real estate finance team as well. So we can all, you know, sometimes being in that bigger firm hedges you a bit in order so that when things change you can move your resource around and I know when we were really busy we would borrow the insolvency property lawyers and vice versa um, so that's quite handy um, the economic uh, yeah the, uh, the 2008 economic cycle that was really slightly um, tricky on a real estate perspective and uh, you know there were some big firms uh, I was fortunately not in one of them, but there were some big firms where they put everyone in two rooms and said to one room, right, you haven't got a job anymore. And that was pretty brutal. Um, but actually, this time round, um, I think people have learned from that lesson from a real estate perspective. Um, there's been an anticipation that this might happen. So actually, it's a pause and a hold, not a the world's going all, you know, up in flames from a real estate perspective. And, and actually, things are coming back. And also... Um, Law firms adapt. So, you know, in my area, we've got the, the energy crisis means people are looking at their portfolios and energy work and other things. So actually what I found in my area, so I, I tend to do development work and I've always grown up doing develop, you know, big developments in the city center and then logistics and then um, big projects and tech and then energy. Largely when I started doing National Grid, but just big projects and now co-head of energy, which also is your career changes all the time. And if you want to keep learning, which is, one of my key fundamentals being in a law firm, you can just keep learning. But that ability to, to change, change what you do and change what the firm does and your focus, um, there's loads of opportunities out there. So even when things change, you just adapt. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's the important point. These are shape-shifting organisations and there's always change. Right, we've got something specifically asked about DWF, and, but also um, referring to AI, because I know AI is quite often a hot topic. So... Uh, for DWF, how does your firm bring legal tech into the work to improve efficiency for clients, particularly in terms of AI? I guess it's JP, and the, but then if anyone else has got any sort of quick AI bits, it always seems to be the thing that's coming, but not quite yet. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, so at the minute, unvarnished truth, right? AI in legal services means we are a little bit quicker at finding and reviewing documents. End of, right? <laughs> All the stuff that's talked about, I mean, part of my job for the last five years has been looking at and properly testing new technologies. And most of them don't work. Most of them, <laughs> if they do work, won't be adopted because they do something in a way that the, the, the human being that's still fundamental to the process doesn't like. Um, so, so AI is, what, one, it's a term that could just mean anything. Honestly, so it, it, I, yeah, I've heard um, photocopiers being referred to as AI. It, it's, it's just not. I mean, what you've got to think about is there are opportunities for certain types of tasks and activities that a human would once have done to be enhanced or replaced by, by technology. Um, and that's a good thing because it usually it's the dross work that's boring and annoying and takes all your time. And, and really, that's all you've got to think about. Uh, you know, someone starts talking to you about AI or RPA or machine learning or whatever else, half the time they genuinely won't know what they're talking about, I promise you. Um, and it's overhyped. But it is really important to know enough about it, particularly this idea of utilising technology to make things easier for the client or to make things easier for the people doing the work. That's the best way to think about it. Um, and actually more interesting and more important is the value of data that is um, produced and extracted during a legal process because one of the directions that we will go in is that sometimes the data that you gather will be as valuable as the advice you can provide. So just one anecdote to, to Deborah's point about knowing the market. 
one of the best pieces of technological innovation for me is nothing to do with AI and it's all to do with data and people capturing data properly because actually that, as well as your opinion, your feel for the market, you've got information about all of the transactions that you've done starts to tell you insights into what are happening and actually clients will pay for those insights um, because it's a form of advice. So I think, I think on AI, cautionary tale, keep an eye on it, but make sure you know what they're talking about. And just as importantly as kind of AI and technologies is the data that technology allows you to capture through the transaction. Great, thank you. We are starting to run short on time. We've got another question up here, which was one where I was going to cover anyway, which is how important is diversity and inclusion to your firm? I think everyone's going to say it's important. So maybe more interesting question is how has firms' behaviours been changing recently with regards to diversity and inclusion? And I think maybe more, more expansively as being good corporate citizens seem to be you know, much more part of that wider community. Deborah, you got something on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer in if you can see it, you can be it. Um, and at, at Shoes, we've got a really you know, strong female partnership. Within uh, the national banking team, we're actually predominantly female. Um, and, it, and it does make a difference. Um, how law firms, I think, have been alive to it for a long time, and it, and it's really quite difficult um, to to. It takes a long time to make the shift, but I think it's just that constant awareness of the need for diversity and inclusion. I don't think you're pushing it. You are pushing on an open door. Nobody is actively saying, actually, we need to keep it male, pale, and stale. Let's do that because that's the way forward. It just takes time. It's convincing, you know, it, it, there's a really good spread. I think, you know, you look like around the room and there's, there's a good diversity spread in here. You know, the first time I did this panel, I was the only woman. Now, you know, you two are edging out onto the side. We'll have taken over. I'm definitely um, worried that I'm not going to be invited back. <laughs> but I, I think ultimately we need you guys to help with the diversity and the inclusion. You know, and, and when you said about the ideas, it's coming ideas coming from you. We're, I'm really old. These are not as old as me. But, you know, what I think is a great idea on the diversity and inclusion piece isn't necessarily how you guys feel. So, so tell us. You know, we really want to know, it, are there things that you feel are, are, are barriers within law firms on the diversity and inclusion front? Great. And, and maybe, Cathy, anything else that firms are doing more generally in the sort of CSR space, the governance space? Yeah, so, so um, I completely agree about, uh, about bringing people in and sharing your ideas and just encouraging your law firms. You know, we want to be diverse places because that's the way you get the best teams and you get the best uh, insights and you evolve. And, and um, I think it's really um, tricky because it's a, it's a long, it's a really long-term play in many respects. You know, the the, the environment that you can, there's more women in law, there's more women coming through, and that's great. From an ethnic diversity, you know, encouraging that and bringing through, and I, I, you know, um, but it's 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 really challenging, and it's that longer-term piece. So um, our CSR strategy is called unlocking and potential, and that's access to law, um, access to education. Um, and, and so we work with schools, but it's a really long-term play because, you know, I, I personally feel really passionate about that school access piece. Um, just, you know, I, I came from, I, I'm, I'm Welsh, not that you can hear it, but I am. Um, you know, and none of my family had ever been to university. So, you know, that access, and it was only because the teacher was really pro um, getting people into university and doing that, that, that I ended up in university and then I had to do law. I didn't want to be a didn't know what I wanted to be, to be honest with you. Um, but um, it was only through that. And so that encouragement at school level and aspiration, I think, is so important. Um, and I would encourage anything you can do with your schools and bring it through, you know, and, and that side uh, and showing that law is accessible to everyone. So important. But, um, it's a long term play. and You know, it's not a, a quick fix. And we're doing lots. And it's, it's really important. Um, but yeah, it takes time as well. Great. OK. Look, we're, I realise we are now. I thought we had... We were 10.55, but it's 10.50 we're finishing. Um, so if maybe I forgot to ask each of you just to have a, a final um, tip on what maybe, you yeah, know, what, what you should do now and what will make you a good commercial lawyer. To get back to that one we did, we sort of swerved. So JP, if you go first. Um, so I think mine's a, a play on the theme that Deborah's already said of don't be a dick, um, which, which is um, you, never, you never know who you're going to come into contact with so actually, if you end up being an authentic, genuine, nice person and you try to get on with people, 
in my experience, that's the very best way of operating. <coughs> There's lots of other tactics and techniques that people will talk to you about, but I think if you keep that at the centre, which is be who you are in a place that you enjoy working and get on with people, even sometimes if you're not that keen on them, that, that, that really helps, genuinely. I, I've, I've worked with some people who I wouldn't naturally get on with, but you know, actually the more you get to know, the more you understand them, the better. And I think commercially, it's that idea of never lose sight of the people. So it's, yes, there's lots of technology. Yes, there's lots of uh, financial and commercial decisions to make. But ultimately, still, the good part of law is, it's, is it's, it's about people working together to solve problems. So I think always think about the people. Great. Shara? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with all of that. I think I'd probably say don't close yourself off to something that you think that's what I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do. That's who I'm going to be. If, if my plan had gone right, I'd be sitting here right now saying, hi, I'm Shara. I'm a criminal barrister because I was called to the bar 15 years ago. The call to the bar bit's right. And Deborah's <laughs> a short, and Deborah's a short exactly. as well. So. Exactly. And it's just like, this is just never what I envisaged I was going to be. And I'd never even thought about immigration. I didn't study at a university when I went through, because I did traditional law um, and I didn't study it or anything along those lines. But you will just have different opportunities that will present themselves to you and just never close yourself off from any of them because you just don't know the thing that's going to grab you and say, do you know what? That's fascinating to me. And when you are genuinely working in an area that you find really, really interesting, it's so much easier to then just stay alive to how that impacts everything. Don't get me wrong, I cannot watch a Christmas movie where somebody moves to another country and meets a prince and they fall in love and she stays there forever without thinking, well, what's her visa situation? So it, it, it will impact your life. But, but you know, but that's great because it's something that I'm genuinely passionate about. And look, being a really good commercial lawyer, you, you genuinely do have to actually care about what you're saying to people because you cannot do the best for your clients unless you care about what's best for them. Great, good words. Kathy. Oh, I think we've covered lots of this already. I'm going to ask you a different question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you do need to um, enjoy what you do. I mean, it is hard work. I'm, I'm not taking away from the fact it is hard work, you know. And um, But if you work hard and you enjoy what you do and um, just always come to it, new ideas and have your eyes open, I agree, from, from a career perspective, but also... You know, you can make a difference. You know, you can make a difference in so many areas, and just um, you know, work hard and bring yourself to work, and um, and and never be afraid to voice your opinion and, and have thoughts, but also respect what other people. Everyone's different. The way we work is different. You know, everybody in a law firm has value. Everybody. You know, so you know, be nice to everybody. Be somebody that you know your colleagues want to work <laughs> with and your clients want to work with, and you'll be successful. Okay, and your, your different question, Deborah, is all these people smiling at you here, what can, what's the one thing they can do today that's going to improve their chances? Talk to people. Just talk to people. Get to, Be interested and be interesting. And, and you won't go wrong. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much, all the panel. That was it. Stop. <laughs>